Okay, good morning, everybody. Now we have to switch uh, to English. Welcome to this uh, section organized by Scienze Regionali, the Italian Journal of Regional Science, the flagship journal of the Italian section of the Regional Science Association International. As editor-in-chief of the journal, I have the duty to introduce uh, our keynote speaker. This year, my job is uh, hard and simple at the same time. Hard because we have an impressive keynote speaker, a distinguished member of the international scientific community, a person with an astonishing record of scientific achievements, who has been honored and rewarded of his, for his scientific work many and many times. According to the AD Scientific Index of 2022, he is among the best 2% in his country of origin, Belgium, in Europe, but also in the world. In two different categories, of course, economics and economics and econometrics. Today, my job is also simple because everybody in this room knows him having read one of his seminal papers at least once in their career. I'm talking about Jacques Francois Tisse. Jacques Tisse is Professor Emeritus at the Center of Operational Research and Econometrics at the Catholic University of Louvain, where he has served for more than four decades uh, as a professor, but also as a president. At international level, he has been visiting professor and affiliate professor to several European and non-European universities. He is a, a RSIA International Fellow, and in 2007 he received the ERSA Prize. In 2010, the NARSC awarded him with the Walter Heizard Award. He has developed original insights about the importance of space in a broad variety of fields, including industrial organization, regional economic development, urban economics, international trade, game theory, public finance and public choice. He has also developed a research program of theoretical work in location on issue of location and economic geography. To summarize the main results of his immense work in all these fields of research is virtually impossible. Jacques is the author or the editor of more than 10 books and several hundreds of scientific papers, works which have been published in the most important scientific journals in the world. Many of his books and papers are required reading for students in regional science, operation research and economics, and for any scholar interested in analyzing problems in economics and social sciences from the perspective of economic geography. I think that each of uh, us has read and carefully study some chapters, if not all, of the economics of agglomeration, co-authored with Masahita Fujita and published by the Cambridge University Press, and of economic geography, uh, co-authored with Pierre-Philippe Combe and Thierry Mayer, uh, and published by the Princeton University Press. His fundamental work on the spatial aspects of industrial organization has guided different generations of scholars in analyzing spatial competition in differentiated markets, in examining the role of income disparities and in understanding price competition and monopoly in spatial markets. His theoretical contribution to regional economics include, among many things, the political economy of factor mobility in general, and more in particular, studies linking labor mobility and the heterogeneity of product demand over space, as well as empirical analysis of the linkage between modes of learning and the development of the industrial district, the competitive advantage of regional clusters, the special policy of foster economic growth. 
His research on urban economics has clarified the importance of spatial competition in the markets for land and for structures in pricing strategies and in the efficiency of the resource allocation. His more recent works are equally intriguing and interesting as they address current issues that still need to be studied and properly addressed. I mention only two of them. First, to be connected or not to be connected, the role of long-haul economists. And when is environmentalism good for the environment? Today, he will lead us to discover another hot topic, the impact of working from home on cities. In the past three years, the COVID-19 pandemic has forced many of us to change our approach to work. We have taught remotely, attending meetings, seminars, and conferences also remotely. It is the fourth time to ask whether this new way of conceiving work will have lasting consequences on our social life and the way we conceive the experience of cities. Please, Professor Tis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay, so you have more or less uh, 45 minutes, and then we have uh, some, uh, um, we leave some space for a uh, question from the floor. Please. First of all, I'd like to thank Roberta for inviting me to give this keynote lecture. Um, well, it's not the first one I gave, right? but you know, after a while, the marginal utility of this kind of stuff starts decreasing. But beyond a certain age, it starts increasing again, right? So I'm part of, I'm in this section of the curve. So it's really a great pleasure for me to be here, especially in Italy, which is, which is certainly one of my favorite countries. So what I will present today is joint work. The first quarter is Japanese, the second one is Russian, but is now in Italy, as a sort, is professor, but is refugee. Uh, the third one is Canadian for professors in the UK. And I'm the, I'm the fourth one. Actually, uh, I don't know, we start by two, and then the third one is Jonas. And then the fourth one, so eventually, I don't know if it will be a fifth one, we'll see. Uh, let me start with two facts. Right? The first one is about San Francisco, which used to have a very vibrant city. But now, they have a problem to bring back, right? Some workers to bring them back to the offices. So the city, the city council just decide to do something. And among these things, what they decide is to bring to a football team, right? Like in the old days, a bit, that's something that Detroit did many, many years ago, right? So that's a bit an image, right? The pictures of uh, San Francisco nowadays. Uh, the second fact is in London, right? If you take the city of London, 14% of restaurants has been shut down. I went to the LSC to give a seminar in March, and actually all the restaurants where they bring their speakers, right, for after the seminar, all of them are closed. And we had to experience a, a new one, which was a very good Italian restaurant, by the way. <laughs> So the problem is for among those people, but some others, right? And if you look at London, fortunately the pointer doesn't work very well, you see ah, an extreme concentration, this is great London, right? An extreme concentration of high-skilled people, in especially in the city of London, but not just there, right? And the air here is pretty big because if you take the maximal distance, it covers 80, 80 kilometers. We're not talking about a small area, not a huge area, but not a small one, right? So what we want to do in this paper is to see, we're not going to discuss how much time, what's the share work? Is it two days, two days per week, three days per week? That's a very difficult issue, and so far nobody knows, right? Who is going to decide? The workers, the company, would it be a bargaining between the two of them? the governments, trade unions? Nobody knows so far, right? 
So we treat it as exogenous. Assume that some share of your work is two days per work, it's just that. And then we do comparative statics, something which is fairly common, you know, in economics. So, well, I mean, let me just, there are just some number, right, that shows that the monocentric city model is not a bad approximation for, the, for London, despite its size, right? But more interesting for us is the following. If you look at the blue line, right, which is obtained from data on sales before 2019, right? And then you look at the red line, which is about the sales in 1920 and 21. What do you see is that the slope of the gradient is flatter. Right? Now, here I have to be extremely careful, right? No structural analysis. We don't study the causality. It's just something that suggests that there might, there might be an interesting problem to study. Because this flattening of the land gradient really suggests that some people move away from more or less the city center and went further and further away from the city center. That for sales, now for rents, same thing, right? So again, for the two type of uh, housing cost, sales or rent, people have moved away from the CBD to go to the suburb and the suburbs will be sometimes 50 or 60 kilometers away, right? So, we just jump that. Now, who are those people? Typically, the skilled people, right? sometimes the high skilled people. There is a paper by uh, Dingell, Jonathan Dingell and Newman, at the very beginning that suggests that for the US, about 40%, a bit less, of American workers could work home. More recent people suggest uh, that it's more or less to be like that, right? Between 35, 40%, right? And typically, there are people with a university degree. It's not all of them, but the big majority, right? So people like us, okay? So let me skip that. Something which is interesting and important for us is the role of the unskilled people. Because at first sight, we might say, okay, Homeworking is an issue for the skilled workers, not for the unskilled workers. Because they won't, they won't work home, so it's not an issue for them. And the answer is no, it's a mistake. It's a mistake because for two reasons at least, and I hope to show you that the issue is, is a relevant one. It's uh, in city centers, we have a lot of jobs, of unskilled jobs. Why? Because the skill or goal to the city centers. After they work, they go to restaurants, they go to bar, they go to different clubs to do sport, they go to barber shop, many, many stuff like that. Right? And you see that in the city of London, 14% of restaurants were shut down. Yes, I mean, of course, a great cook may be considered a skilled worker, right? But not everybody who works in a restaurant is to be considered as a high skilled worker. So what happened to those people? Those people who provide these local consumer services, which are not true, they have to be consumed on the spot. And if people don't go to high skill workers, don't go to the CBD, they won't consume those goods. What will happen to these workers? That, that's something we want to discuss. Now, Nick Bloom, Right, who has, who has been working on these issues for many years. He has a very well known paper in QGE with photos published in uh, 2015. Well, said that up to half of the local spending would just disappear. Which is huge, right? half. Right? Now, of course, it's not, he didn't prove it, but we have a very detail by De Freya and his daughter about the UK that. If people work home two days a week, just two days a week, 20% of these jobs will be destroyed. Right? So even if we take the, the lower bound and not the upper bound by Nick Bloom 50%, even 20% is not negligible. Now, 
what do we see? Well, how much people spend is not negligible, right? We see for the London, we have an estimation. People spend in the city center about 5% of their income. But we talk about 5% of fairly high income. In the US, it's much higher, more than 12%. And if you look at the last, the, the highest quartile, it reached 17%. In other words, it's like a luxury good. Right? The higher your income, the higher is the share of your income you spend on these local consumer services. And this is associated with something that we observed, which is well documented in the US, the gentrification of the most productive American cities. Now, what do we do? We develop models, right? That's part of uh, my standard activities. Uh, so we consider first the one city model, and if I have a bit of time, I would like to talk about the two city model, because this gives rise to the fact that people can work home, generate another issue. You don't have to live in the city where you work. You could live in a city where housing costs are very low, and you work in a city where housing costs are very high, but wages are also very high. Right? So let's start with one city, and a monocentric city, the, the standard model, Alonso, right? Two types of workers, skilled and unskilled, three production factors, three, three primary goods, land, skilled labor, and unskilled labor, the mass of low skill and skilled workers are supposed to be given in this, in this first model. Right? So, we assume that the skilled spend a share, a given share of their income on local consumers. We don't endogenize the share. But you see that this share, when you apply it to the income, because the income is endogenous, the expenditure will be endogenous. So we use, when we do our numerical analysis, we use the data we have. We say, okay, 5% of the UK, 12% of the US, what's the impact? Now, who will be our given share of homeworking? Two days per week, 0.4. Okay. It's the amount of time you spend, the share of time you spend home, working home. And of course, one minus four is the time you spend in the office. Now, we also assume, if I have time, I will tell you what happens when we relax this assumption. We take the standard assumptions of a fixed lot size. Everybody consumes one unit of land. But we can relax this assumption. Uh, now, it's fairly standard at the beginning, right? We have here the constituents. Does not matter. We have here the utility function of the skilled workers, which depends on what? The consumption of the goods, the homogeneous goods, right, which is produced within the city, as well as the consumption of the local consumer service data. Whereas the unskilled just consume the goods. And of course they consume land, but we know by assumption they consume one unit, so there is no need to introduce this unit into the utility function because it's supposed to be given. Okay? What is interesting, of course, is the budget constraint. For the, for the unskilled consumer, you see that... Oh, shit. Okay, that's... The good is the numeraire, so the price is one. They consume this quantity, they pay the land rent at location X, and they pay commuting costs, which depend on the distance, but it also depends on the income, because we have more and more empirical evidence that show that commuting costs depend on the same distance, 10 kilometers, the commuting cost increases with the income of the commute. Now, for the skilled workers, you see the story is a little bit different. We have consumptions, we have the land rents, black for the skill, but here, we have the expenditure on local public goods, where P is the price of the local, public, local consumer service, excuse me. And then we have the commuting cost, no people, rho equal zero, they commute every day. Rho equal one, they never commute. And then depending on the frequency, depending on the share, the time share they spent working home, 
you have different, you spend a different amount of your income on commuting. Now, it looks like the budget constraint of the unskilled is unaffected when you look at that. And the answer is no, it is affected through two different mechanisms. The first one is that we know that the value of housing in one location affects the value of housing in neighboring location and flows so on from one location to other and so on. We have interdependencies of housing price across location within a city. Therefore, if the price, housing price rises or falls for the scale, it will have an impact on the housing cost for the upscale, first point. Second, because we know that commuting costs are very important, especially to the skill, and it's one of the driving force for the residential choice, if the skill change location in the city, they have a higher bid, you know, for location. They can pay more because they have a higher wage than the unskilled. So they can decide to take up over the location chosen by the unskilled before home working. So then the unskilled have to change locations. Therefore, the welfare of the unskilled will be affected by the decision made by the skilled, who are those affected by home working. In other words, we have some redistributional impact, which are almost never mentioned in, in the media or in the press right so far. So now you see this is how much the skill, skip the details, how much the skill spend when they work in the city center. And it pretty, this big L is the ratio between the number of skill over the number of skilled workers. And you see that one minus rho is critical here, right? It increased with rho and this is already well documented in another paper by Yanni de Freya and his daughters. Now, let's consider the production side. We take it very simple, right? Very, very simple. Constant return to scale, perfect competition. Don't tell me this assumption are unrealistic. I know that, we all agree. But to start with, we start with something simple. We have a Cobb Douglas production function for the consumption sectors, and the local consumer services are produced only by the unskilled. So the unskilled have two job opportunities. They work either in the final sector to produce the consumption goods, or they work in restaurants to produce local consumer services. So immediately you need to understand that when the number of job opportunities for the unskilled trades and the city center, they have to go to the final to work in the final sector if there is no unemployment. They have to go to the final sectors. Now, their marginal productivity is going to decrease. It's already, you know, it's, very, it's not great news for them, in other words. But at the same time, if we have a simple production function, the marginal productivity of the skill increases. In other words, what we will see is that the wage of the unskilled decreases and the wage of the skill rises. In other words, we have more income inequality. Right? And no location changes. Just that. Right? The reshuffling of the unskilled between the two sectors. So this is my production function here. Now, this is cop to glass, right? Everybody knows that. Now, what is this stuff? Right? Is the TFP of workers? We have a TFP. We are all together. We work, let's say, uh, in the final sector. And we used to work in the office. So our TFP was, let's say, the degree of agglomeration economies or something like that. Right? Some form of increasing returns, external increasing returns. Now, instead of being all together in the office, well, 15% or 20% of us will work home, or maybe we will work home two days per week home. So only 80% or 60% of us will be together. So less interaction than before, right? although we use computers, but I still believe that they're not perfect substitute. 
So what is critical is how the TFP of the skilled workers here will change with the rate of, uh, of home working. There is only one empirical paper on that nowadays. Well, there are two, to be precise, but one that really tried to measure this effect. And it doesn't look like a great news. Right? It looks like a road tends to decrease. And the work by uh, or Japan, it's, uh, it's even worse, because uh, one of my friends in Japan has the opportunity to observe a sample of workers in June 19 and to observe the productivity of the same guys, the same people who work home one year after, their productivity was 30% lower. Okay. On average, of course, on average. Some highly skilled workers were almost as productive as before. But if some were almost as productive as before, if the average is 30% less, this means that some of them were much, much lower. Right? So, but we don't know yet. We have to be very careful with this kind of stuff, right? Because the Japanese company are organized in a, in a special way, which need not be the same in the US or in Europe. So now, the empirical work which I mentioned is by Mo, Mo Davis, whom several of you know, and two young people. And what they do is to use a CS, right? To say, okay, that's the, the amount of time you work home, but it's an imperfect substitute with the amount of time you spend in the office. It's not just to say you just add them up. Now, the issue is how big is the elastic substitution? If it goes to infinity, they are almost perfect substitutes, great news if it is very high. If it is very small, they are bad substitutes, which is not a great news. On top of it, they say, well, you know, you work with your computer, but Maybe you are, everything works well. Ah, maybe that this afternoon, just in the middle of a talk, just stop, does not work. The computer does not work, or the connection is bad, or some of the people you work home, your children are back in the home, they make a lot of noise, you have to stop the thing and say, please shut up, I mean, I'm working. This kind of stuff that makes you a bit less productive, right? And this is captured by the coefficient phi, and in their estimation, but they are very careful, right? In their estimation, that fight is much smaller than one. Okay? But again, right, we have to be careful. But they suggest that uh, working home is definitely not a perfect substitute for the office working. Right? Now, what it is reasonable to believe is that this function is single peak, something like that. Before the COVID, the share of home workers was low, positive but low, around 5% in the EU, a bit more in the US, but not, not much. So it's not zero, right? It's, uh, now, at the beginning of the COVID, maybe it was that. Now, full time, to assume that everybody works home equal one, everybody works home, well, I mean, uh, I asked in a discussion, I asked uh, Nick Bloom. I do, ex I do ex explain that almost no firm choose the system of full-time work. How do you explain that? And then a short silence, and Nick said, they all made mistakes. I don't buy the assumptions that all firms all over the world did not understand that home working is the perfect solution for them. So full-time for us, full-time working, you know, at the beginning maybe it's good news because they save a lot of money on housing in particular. They sort of the red off this way. So it increases a little bit and then it starts decreasing. In other words, it is single piece or bell shape. Not necessarily concave, but something like this. And then it starts decreasing. <laughs> that the assumption will make. Now, the two types of workers, the skill are supposed homogeneous. We could extend the model to allow them to be homogeneous. The unskilled are also heterogeneous, homogeneous, but we could extend it, blah, blah, blah. Now, basically, we get two possible equilibrium configurations for the city. First, the gentrified city in which the skill are located near the city center. And then you have the unskilled who live more or less in the, in the periphery of the city. 
right? They got to go the gentrify city. And the other possible equilibrium configuration is the donut. That's the expression of Lee Bloom. You know, everybody knows what a donut is, the empty, well, it's not empty because we have the scale. But you don't, you don't, if you say that a vibrant city is a city where you have many restaurants, when you have many bars, when you have theaters and this kind of stuff, uh, if it is not there anymore, in a way, it's a little bit empty, right? Even if some people live there, the attractiveness of the center messed up. Okay? That's why it's called a donut city. So I already mentioned that. So increasing the rate of home working tends to exacerbate wage or income inequality. And I explain you why. Now, when can we say that we start initially, right? Whole equals zero. Everybody works in the office. We get the gentrification. Because people want, the high skill workers, want to consume on their commuting cost. When they have a high commuting cost, or they are not eager, although we do observe in the real world that there is some sort of urbanization. But what we see first in Europe, unlike the United States, even in the 90s, uh, we had a lot of high-skill workers who live near the city center because we have in Europe, in many cities, very nice city centers. Uh, go to Arizona or to Phoenix and have a chance to look at what they call the city center who would like to live there, right? So in many American cities, they are not terribly exciting. Now, what you see is that in some American cities, more and more skilled workers want to go to the city centers. Why? because they want to economize on commuting. They are hard workers, they, have, they make a lot of money, they work in IT or finance company, they work hard, they often work more, definitely more than eight hours per day, a day, and they don't want to go home and cook. They don't want to go home and fix this and that. So they want all these things to be done for them. It's a kind of consumption also thing. Consuming at a city center is the option, those who are familiar with London so have seen all these pubs where people go there, go there, you know, to have a drink with their friends, colleagues. Now, if we observe a change in the city center based on the income, difference, when does it appear? Well, we have to appeal here to the work of Masa Fujita, right? To, we did a great work. It shows that what matters here is when the land rent, to be precise, the bid rent functions, of the high income people cross the bid rent functions of the low income. Now, those with the high income people is always above the bid rent functions of the low income people. It's really obvious. But even the high income people consume a finite amount of land. Right? They don't go in. So they consume a finite amount of land, and the land or the housing which is left goes to the low income. Questions, where does it happen? Under which condition can we say that the slope of the bid rent functions, for you it should be like that, changes? Okay? Because the bid rent functions can be shown to be a decreasing function. And eventually you end up with this condition, which is the wage of the skill over the wage of the other skill, which both depend on rho. Okay? Because they are the wages and the genus, they depend on rho. And the right hand side here also depend on who. So it's a simple relationship, but it's not trivial. Okay? Now, I'm not doing this, that's too complicated. What is interesting here, yes, yes, there is a threshold, which doesn't look like when we put numbers which are not implausible, right? We have to be careful. When we put numbers which are not implausible into our functions, solve the model numerically, we find a threshold which is not close to one. It's something like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, right? Where the city structure change from a gentrified city to a donut city. Of course, in the real world, this will not happen overnight. Right? We know that some people, if there is, if this is true, some people will move from the city center to the periphery and this process, if Rho increases more, if we move up well, from 0.4 to 0.6, or maybe to 0.8, we 
which is not, you know, <laughs> I have son-in-laws, son-in-laws, sorry. Uh, for one of them, one of them it's 0.8, and for the other, it's one. And they have no choice. It's a decision of the company. You see? So it's fairly high, which generates another interesting problem because they might keep their job for a while, but if working full-time home, the one who work one, is as efficient as it was before in the office, why not to hire someone from India? Okay? Which is something that people never discuss. Anymore. So what is interesting here again is that one of the advantage when you look at the, at the media, especially the business literature, they said the, the skill will spend less on housing. Housing will be cheaper for them because they commute less and so on and so forth. And yes, they save money on what we call urban costs. Urban costs are defined as housing costs plus commuting costs. We could add more, but typically, you know, in the basic model of urban economics, they are the two types of costs we focus on. By contrast, the unskilled are worse off in the sense that they be a higher urban cost. Uh, because still there is the pressure of the skilled workers, the land rent remains high enough so that now they compete near the city center and they have to commute every day. So they spend more than before. So first, the wage of the unskilled decreases, Second, the urban cost of the skill. Now, we have to be careful. Not all of them. It depends how close they are to the CBD. Okay? You cannot just say all the unskilled who are between the boundary between the skill and the unskill and the CBD will have higher urban cost. Those who are close to it. So some of the unskilled are going to be even worse off than some other. So these issues are not completely obvious. Why? Because incomes are endogenous. So working with exogenous income like some people do so far, it's a very, very strong assumption. Very quickly, if I have a couple of minutes, I didn't talk much about agglomeration economies. If you add agglomeration economies into model by assuming that the intensity of the agglomeration economies is a decreasing function of growth, because when we are together, right, we talk, we exchange ideas, we tend to be more productive than when we use Zoom or this kind of stuff. Then you slow down the process. You understand you have a counter force that attracts people to the center, right? So the, seat, the value of Hobart, the threshold value, increases. But there is a Simon issue. If you work home, then you better, and if you work home, let's say two or three days per week at least, you better have, have something like a study, right? Because during the lockdown in the US, half of the American workers work in the bedroom. Now, that's a solution for a few months. It cannot be a solution for a few years. Now, what happened when your children come back from school and they are to the kitchen, the kitchen is back to your bedroom and this kind of stuff. How do you work in this thing? So you need a study. You need an office. Now, if your partner also works home, that's just, you share it with, ah, it's difficult, right? So maybe you need two of them. Now, do we have empirical evidence? The answer is yes. Some people study, there were some home workers in the US prior to the COVID. 7% more or less, 7-8%. What they found out, comparing workers in the same uh, local labor market as well and so forth, controlling from everything, they found that people who work home consume seven, their housing place is 7% bigger than those who used to work in the office. Because yes, they need space. Now, if you keep in mind that on average in the US, you know, their place tends to be bigger than in Europe. These 7% are not that small. And I can tell you, because I, I know I'm talking about that, when you live in Paris in 60 square meters and you work home and your partner also works home, then it becomes a big mess very quickly, right? So they need more space. But who is going to pay for that? Not the company. Okay? The worker. So maybe the, the wage increases, but if they, have, if they need a bigger place, it's not so obvious, right? When you live in 60 square meters in Paris and you need 
an office, so I need maybe what 67, 668 square meters is not that big after all, right? It's much more money. And you better move to another place, it becomes something which is not easy to do. There are some things that could help. And that's that's part of the literature the literature, part of the debate in the business literature in the US that having an office CBD is bad for cities. Even prior to the COVID, there were debates about that. We need something else. We need what? Ah, debates. Okay, I have friends who work at the uh, European investment banks several years ago, and I told them that, Alfred, Alfred your salary, you, you keep saying that your salary is the highest salary of an economist in Europe. Why is it so? You are right, I know that, but why? Jack, you know, to live in Luxembourg is not great fun. Right? So it's a form of compensation. There is nothing to do. And actually, the government of Luxembourg became really aware of that. They asked McKinsey, what should we do? Well, McKinsey said, you need a university. They have one. Which is becoming better and better. You need a philharmonic. So they don't have enough people to play, you know, the whole weeks, but they have one and they two or something. You need some museums. I don't know the whole list, but this is what the government did. Now, if you think of Roma or Paris, I don't know much Milan, I'm sorry. But if you know Roma or Paris or London, I mean, the center per itself is attractive. During the weekend, you want to go there to see things. There are nice things to visit. You want to go to theater, you want to do stuff. If you go to Wall Street, I did it during Sunday, it's empty. There is not even a place where you can drink one cup of this bloody American coffee. Okay? So there is nothing to do. You may just say, I've seen Wall Street, that's it. Okay. So there are very few people, there is almost no potential. So if we have CBDs like that, they are not going to attract people. But if we have CBDs like Roma or Paris or London, then these restaurants, this bar might keep another flow of customers. So that this make the gentrified city more robust to the shop. But you don't decide just like that, let's have historical buildings, right? Now, you may try to build a museum, a bit like in Luxembourg. You may try to subsidize a bit uh, restaurants or some places like that, but that's not something easy to do. So some cities are going to resist this much better than others. And again, in the US, they are very much concerned about it because they recognize that they have many CBDs, which are office CBDs, and almost nothing else. There is no reason for tourists or for the local people to go there just for sightseeing. There's nothing to see. Okay? So here, yes, some cities with a differentiated CBD will resist better than others. Now, and now, do I still have five minutes? How much time? It's five. Okay, sorry. It's enough. Now, the other issue, what, is, what do we observe? That, again, you look, because things move, tend to move more quickly. In the US, although it starts here little. Some people who were still people who work in Milan, who came from southern Italy, what they say, why not to go back to my village? If I convince the mayor that I should have a good internet connection, it would be fun. My cousin are still there. Uh, we used to have a nice garden and so on and so forth. And some of them went there went down there to southern Italy. I don't know how big it was, but very quickly after, in, in the US, they start doing this. People went in different kind of places. Some of them went to Florida because of the weather. Some of them went to another state because the income tax is lower. Some others went to big, still in the big, big New York because they can have a big gardens. Because, you know, the Americans are, you, you have good reasons to be careful with the pandemic. 
Uh, but the Americans, even if, if it is a tiny reason, they, they get very nervous about you know pandemic disease and stuff like that. So you have quite a few workers who want to have distances from the other workers, right? And when we share the steam elevators uh, along in Manhattan, it, it's a big of an issue. And, and there is a substantial share of workers who don't want to do it anymore. Okay? That's what it meant. So those people want to work home because they say there will be another pandemic tomorrow, which is probably true. Right? So here this means what? This means that those who work in the city, the mass of workers, is not the mass of residents. Because those people work for a company which is located in New York, but they live in another city. Or they work for a company which is located in Milan or in Paris, but they live in another place. And if they have a high-speed railway, which is exactly what we have in France, which they also in the UK they have a lot, they can live 200. My, my quarter from Leicester told me that you can join, you can commute from almost in any English, English, not British, eh? English city to London for today's, for today's period. You can do it. We have enough train, they are fast enough. Well, it's going to be one hour and a half, two hours in the morning, but twice a week it's doable. And they live in other cities. Now, do we see that in the data? Look at that, there are significant differences in productivities, right? So, working in Greater London, it's, it's a good news, right? And there are a few other cities too. But you have some other cities where it's not that great. So, look at those guys, what happens? I work in uh, London. I get a pay from this company, they pay very well the workers. But instead of being a higher band cost in London, I go to a nice neighborhood, a nice neighborhood in Leicester. And with my salary, I can outbid the local people. And I get a nice place. In a, they, they don't go to, to crappy neighborhood, right? they, they go to very nice neighborhood. It's also something we are observing. And what do we observe? Is that something that we can find in the data? Yes. You see again, right now, what we have on the vertical axis is in log, right, as usual. You have the prices of houses. And then here you have, in a way, the productivity of workers. And what you see that actually, yes, the productivity, you see this is decreasing as the productivity increases, those workers are attracted by further and further areas. Why? Because in the train, they also work. That's a big difference between the train and the car. When I take the high-speed railway between Paris, Brussels and Paris, I work. Maybe not as well as well, but still, the output is not, it's not zero. If I drive, it is zero, plus the stress and so on and so forth. So, we see that, of course, for the moment, we are extremely careful, right? We have two years of observations. We have only two years. But it suggests that maybe that something is going on. And if we believe in urban economics, in the theory of urban economics, then yes, if we have more and more home working, uh, some cities, the city centers of some cities, will lose their vibrancy and there will be more inequality between the skill and the upscale, which is something which is totally unanticipated now in the discussion about homeworking. Am I on time? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Jean-François, for this uh, interesting and inspired presentation. I think that uh, there are some questions on the floor, especially those interested uh, in the territorial implication of co-working. This center, please. Okay. 
Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation. My name is Vicente. I come from Barcelona. And I have a question for you regarding this uh, worry about what happens with cities. Uh, but you have ended talking about welfare. My question is, what about the overall welfare? So should we worry about cities or should we worry about the whole society, rural, the donuts, beyond the donuts, strawberries, I don't know. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the answer is not obvious. I wish I would have been able to give you, uh, I wish I would have been able to give you sharp results about welfare. It's not that obvious because depending on the value of the, the share, the role, right? We know that the income rises, but for the scale. But over some region, the urban cost can increase. Which one increase faster than the other? It depends on the parameters. Now, if income increase faster than the urban cost, we can say, yes, welfare increases. But otherwise, it decreases if it is the other way around. So instead of saying, OK, in this domain, blah, blah, in another domain, blah, blah, which is, which is boring, and not very informative. We talk about income because income are observable and we can say something about that. Now, if we talk about what we call the between city commuters, yes, those who decide to leave London and to go to another city which is two or three hundred kilometers away, they are better off because they keep their income and they pay lower urban cost in the city they, they go to than in London. So they are definitely better off. But those who are in the city, which host now these new people, they are worse off because there is more competition on the housing market. If you think of, let me give you an example of, in France, which I know a little bit, Rennes, which is in Brittany, right? Not too far from Paris, so that it's with the high speed railway, this is possible. What happens? There is a growing number of people going there, Parisian, with a relative higher income, and the local people have mixed feelings. The shopkeepers, they say, oh, great news, we sell more. Huh? We have more customers, local customers. Restaurants, we have good news too. But the local people who want to buy a new place, or the new uh, household where children are on, they want to buy a bigger place, they are unhappy because everything is more expensive. So, you know, talking about welfare in this kind of setting is really something complicated because you have transfer even among those who were in Rennes prior to the COVID. Okay? Some will be are better off and some are worse off depending on their activities. So it's not an easy question. I wish I could say just like that, no. Other question? Other question for no. the floor? Uh, Thank you, uh, I'm Thomas, two, two questions. One is about your assumption. I think you assume that somehow one, peop one person uh, consumes one unit of land. Mm -hmm. If you assume that a poor person consumes less land than a rich person, then eventually your model will be different like we see in many parts of the third world. The other point is that related with Vicente, in fact, it is the redistribution effect of the value of the rent, of the owners of land. It's part of it, And that's yes. uh, it's part of it, okay. It's part of it, okay. yes. Okay. Uh, now, regarding your first question, uh, if you, what two simulations, right? Because of the analytical analysis is not obvious. Once you work with people who have different income, heterogeneous people, nothing is simple, unfortunately, right? But it's interesting. And what we see is that where people, the rich people, consume more land than the poor people, the incentive to go to the periphery is even stronger. So the value of raw bar, the threshold value, become even smaller. That's what you see. And this is intuitive, right? Because those people consume more land, 
they say, wait a minute, my net income, net, net of commuting, right? My net income is higher, so why not to move there? Because in any case, I don't commute very often. Now I can have an even a, a nice garden, which I don't have so far. I have a big apartment, now I'm going to have a house with a garden, and they will move even faster. So it's not a good use, unfortunately. Other. Yes. Hi, Mr. Van Meulen of the OECD. I'm thinking about policy here. Um, you were talking about agglomeration economy, so uh, workers might not take into account that there is spillover effects of all being in the same place, being a bit more creative, being a bit more productive altogether. They might not take it into account in their personal decision about going outside or inside sure. the city. So there are more and more business leaders who are saying, okay, it's been fun for two years, now everyone going back to the office and do your job. How do you see about that and whether should, you know, should it be even be stimulated outside of businesses and say at the government level? Yeah, it, it, it's there. Yeah. No, it's done, I didn't have much time. It's done in the paper. When you allow for agglomeration economies, and if we assume, which I guess is so far reasonable, then the agglomeration economies are stronger when we are in the office than when we work home. Then, if rent, let's make the gentrified city more robust. The, the roba, which is the threshold value, increases. Yes. So that's we can show that. Yeah. We, 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 we deal with this case. Okay. I didn't go into the detail, but we do it. This means what? You know, is this function which I mentioned, this FIRO, the TFP of the skilled workers. How does it vary with hope? So far, the empirical evidence, I, I wish I could you know, use it, but it's not available. We try a lot to find something. But maybe at the beginning it increased, but it looks like, you know, maybe beyond two days per week, when again, plug some uh, not unreasonable numbers into the model, find a solution that it starts decreasing when it exceeds 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, sorry. So those who want to go to 0 0.8 or 1, okay. No, but we, we, yes, it's an important issue and we, we, take, it, we take it into account. Yes. Okay, the last, maybe, thank you. Yeah. Um, as you, as you know, companies, real estate uh, have uh, uh, changed the, the structure. So there are now offices uh, spread uh, around the world in a way. And there is also an increase of new uh, working spaces, co-working spaces, and so on. And there are policies, so I would like to know what you think about. There are policies um, that promote uh, uh, near working. For instance, the municipality of Milan uh, promoted near working for their uh, work workers in order not to work from home, that is not the best place where to work, as you said, but to work in a, 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 another, a, in a third space, like a co-working space. There are also uh, policies, for instance, in uh, Germany, policies in Brandenburg, for instance, to, in a, to uh, uh, support the exit, partially exit from the city, and uh, so people can uh, knowledge workers can go to work in Brandenburg. So there are specific policies to uh, 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 subsidize this, but where do they work? Not at home, but in uh, new uh, working spaces. Uh, in Italy also there is this south working phenomenon and so on. What do you think about uh, third places, new working spaces? Well, I'm, uh, I've, yesterday we had the talk about the importance of regional, uh, the quality of regional institution, right? What is going to be critical here is the quality of the local government. Right? Are they imaginative people or not? Right? Now, if you look at some American cities, they already turn offices into very nice and expensive apartments. Right? They, they, don't, they don't target the medium income. No, no, no. They target the high tail, the high income people with very expensive restaurants. Uh, apartment, excuse me. There are some other places where they try to attract 
small businesses which before the which before the COVID were unable to afford to be in the city centers. And as you say, they subsidize those places. Now we have other cities. Brussels is like that, unfortunately. Uh, and in, in Paris, to some extent, too, because the, it's too fragmented. The offices are empty. And I'm not talking about small places. We have a Brussels a new tower. They, they, a company built two towers. Right? One for the, for the company itself. Now, in these two towers, you had restaurants, cafe, mini, small stores, and this kind of stuff. The COVID, both of them are empty. Now, one is empty. Now, guess what? These two towers were built in an area which was not terribly nice. You know, some drug dealers and stuff like that. So, they want to renovate the area. Now, only one tower is full. Guess what? The workers asked to get a small bus to bring them to the station, whatever, the railway station, because the place is not safe if the evening, after a few months, those people are back already. So this means that they have to move very quickly. Right? Now, again, they, in some part of the U.S., they move very quickly. I'm sure that there are places in Italy where they move very quickly. There are other cities where they are going to run. Because turning, for example, offices, I talked to professionals because I didn't know anything. To turn offices into apartments, it's something difficult and costly. Because in terms of security, elevators, and all that stuff, it's very different. So this is very expensive to do. It's not something you say, okay, we build, you know, a couple of walls and it's not, no, 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 no. It's much more complicated than that. So, yes, some cities will manage to resist very well. Maybe that eventually some companies will find out that they went too far away. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, to read uh, at least a summary of this paper. Thank you. <laughs>